Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Celebrating Act 2. It's great to see you, and thank you for joining Art Kirsch and I as we once again pick the brains of our favorite Hollywood historian, Manny Pacheco. Manny, great to see you again. Well, as always, it's a pleasure to be with both of you. So, so Manny, um, what have we forgotten today? Do you have something special <laughs> that we could have forgotten? <laughs> <laughs> as in as in forgotten Hollywood? Yes. Yes, well, um, of course. I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about some of the forgotten fabulous uh, filmmakers. These are the uh, women who worked behind the scenes during Hollywood's golden age and beyond, and some of the names you might recognize, and I'm sure that a number of them you won't. You know, it's interesting, Manny, because uh, most people don't realize that there have been female directors almost from the beginning of film. Right. Uh, there haven't been many of them. So, right. of course, the male names seem to dominate the conversations. Well, but there's there... been some some significant. Am I, if, if I want to guess correctly, am I correct that uh, uh, who is married to Fairbanks? Uh, oh, Mary Pickford. Who is Mary Pickford a director in the no. early days? No, no, no. But she was a producer. She was part of United Artists. Uh, she had signed the uh, legal document that set up the uh, company with Douglas Fairbanks, mm. Charlie Chaplin, and E.W. Griffith. So that that is a pioneering move for a for a for a person, a female who um, actually um, who actually was part of an owner of a company, and and th and that's back in the 1920s. So. Yeah. That was definitely pioneering. So that's that's a that's a good call right there, John. I'm, I'm pretty okay, impressed with that. Okay, that Manny, I couldn't Manny, remember her name. Manny, stop stalling. Okay, tell us somebody we've forgotten. Well, before I get to my my director, there's one in particular I want to mention, and it's going to surprise you. The story is amazing, and it's definitely going to surprise you. But let's start with a field that's so male dominated that it, there was only one standout uh, a woman in, in in the golden age, and her name was Dorothy Spencer. She was a, uh, an editor, a film editor, and a really renowned film editor, nominated for three Academy Awards. She's also known for her marriage, her long marriage, to actor uh, Frank McHugh. Uh, and Frank McHugh was one of the, uh, the Irish mafia that we've re referenced in the past, a little uh, supporting character actor who actually ran these Irish mafia meetings. But Dorothy Spencer was the serious one of the two. I mean, he kind of had his fun, and acting's always fun. Dorothy Spencer worked really hard at learning her craft in the 1920s and into the 1930s, became a full-fledged uh, um, editor. And uh, for her efforts, I mean, she her name is on some of the greatest films ever created, including the uh, nominated for her, editor-nominated Stagecoach. Mm. She also wow. was nominated for a movie called A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. She yeah. was part of uh, Jack Benny's team in To Have and Have Not in 1942. And she worked with John Ford three times. I mentioned Stagecoach, but he also, she also was involved with uh, My Darling Clementine and yeah. North to Alaska, which is a Henry Hathaway movie. Uh, that Actually, that, that wasn't uh, John Ford. But yeah, um, um, she, she really worked really, really hard at her craft. And, and her third nomination was for a film that we all know, Cleopatra, the Elizabeth Taylor film. Oh, yeah. yeah. Wow, that's a great name. I Now, I was not familiar with her name at all. Of course, and I know should, who Frank McHugh is. Yeah, but, you know, we should because a, a, a lot of very prominent female uh, editors came uh, after her. And the most prominent is uh, Thelma Schoonmaker or Schoonmacher. Uh, Thelma Schoonmacher has worked for 50 years with uh, Martin Scorsese. Really? Martin okay. Scorsese's uh, go-to editor is Thelma Schoonmacher. And uh, she's worked on Raging Bull and The, the Aviator and yep. The Departed. So, I mean, Thelma owes a, a debt of gratitude to Dorothy Spencer because uh, right now, this generation's Dorothy Spencer is Thelma Schoonmacher. So are there yeah. are there others or was it uh, just this uh, scattered 
one person. Oh, there are others, but none as renowned as these two. This is we're talking the cream of the crop here, and and as the cream, you still don't know who she is. You know, it's funny because that editors aren't, you know, they're not talked about. But I mean, imagine, and I don't think I, I, I think I'm preaching to the choir here when I say that you know you don't have a good editor on a film, well, why bother? I mean, you, you lack continuity, you lack the story. Yeah. I mean, you lack everything. All the context that goes into a film is is primarily due to the director, the cinematographer, and the editor. So, I mean, really, I mean, this is why I, I, I can't, I'd be remiss if I didn't spend a moment at least talking about Dorothy Spencer and Thelma Schoenmacher. Now, yeah. uh, you had alluded to, John, about great directors. Well, here's one, and boy, I don't think you expected this. Her name is Lenny Riefenstahl. Oh wow! And you, you yeah, I know you well, know who she I is. didn't expect it just because she's she's notorious. Yes, being, and you uh, know who she Hitler's is. Hitler's favorite filmmaker, yeah. Hitler's film, but she was considered a cause celebre. She was uh, definitely an auteur. She produced, directed, uh, edited, and and wrote many of her propaganda films for Hitler. Uh, she was so talented that she would be in the conversation, I mean, a lot today, if it hadn't been for the stain of really promoting Nazi propaganda and really leading to um, film or cinema that uh, that uh, pointed to the final solution, which is just ghastly. But Lenny Riefenstahl, I mean, Riefenstahl, she... she um, I mean, she she was very good at her craft, it, and, oh, and one she, of the best and least notorious pieces that I can turn people to is her work on covering the 1936 Olympics. Yeah. She did a really nice job on the Olympics, and she even filmed Jesse Owens on, and some of the most famous uh, runs that he did. You know, where he won his gold medals. So she's to be congratulated for you know for at least capturing on on film the 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 efforts by jesse owens so i mean I, I yeah i knew you knew who she was and i realized that she is infamous i mean really yes. her, her her work in many ways was ghastly but you can't ignore the talent that she had and that's that's the deal here and it's just a shame that we can't celebrate her work because her work is really as I said, infamous. Well, I, I, I think you're right. We don't celebrate her work, but, uh, you know, every film student studies her work. That's right. Uh, you're right about that. She, she, is, she was a master, and she was innovative, uh, extremely talented. Uh, it's a shame that her talents were put to use uh, supporting the Third Reich and Hitler, but um, her, her techniques and her, not her career, but her techniques and her Talents are studied uh, by filmmakers. Not celebrated is not the right word, but studied no. because. But let me just offer this: with before Hitler's rise to power during the Weimar Republic's uh, time in, in Germany, this was between World War One and World War Two. Obviously, um, she was the only female director that was allowed to practice their craft in Germany, and this was prior to the rise of Hitler. So that's how talented she was. Yeah. Unfortunately, yeah. in 1932, she went to one of those Nuremberg things, saw Hitler, became mesmerized, and unfortunately, the rest is uh, terrible, terrible history. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I do have one more. Okay. And this is a uh, one name I'm I'm sure you heard of. She was a fabulous actress who went on to become just a terrific director, and she also became a producer and owner of her own company. And that's the great Ida Lupino. Yeah, sure. Yep. You know, most people think of her, you know, as an actress, but I, well, I first fell in love with her as an actress. I just thought she was so pretty, and so she played tough gals, and she played romance, mm. and she. I just thought she was a. Later, many years later, I realized that she was a director and a producer, and I, I, somehow, I just never was enamored of her directing work mm -hmm. the way I was of her acting. But right. I recognize that she was a very, and ta not only a talented director, she was very influential. Right, and for many reasons. And let me just first by saying that she was British, grew up in a British acting family. Her, really? her family in, yeah, you wouldn't think of her as British. I mean, you, <laughs> she didn't have any accent whatsoever, or she yeah. was able to hide it. She grew up in an acting family, and they wanted her to work. She, she Early on, I mean, we're talking high school, she wanted to work behind the scenes. 
But uh, she, she, her talent couldn't be denied. She had to be in front of the camera. And she was discovered, believe it or not, not by Warner Brothers, where much of her great work was from, but by, by Paramount. And so really? she went to Paramount. They really didn't know how to use her as and her talents. They couldn't. They couldn't pigeonhole her into some sort of a typecasted role. Warner Brothers is where they where she was discovered uh, to play that that tough, that tough girl uh, image that she had in High Sierra and They Drive by Night. But yeah. here's the deal: uh, in 1935, she had a very mild case of polio. And while recovering from polio, she decided two things. One, she was going to champion the cause and the, 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 the defeat of polio for the rest of her career. And she did. In fact, I did a film on that later. And the second thing, she thought, well, if she became paralyzed and she couldn't act anymore, she still had the ability to write. And if she couldn't use a pen or a typewriter, she would dictate. And she was committed to the idea of writing scripts, directing film at that point. But it was just a matter of time for her to first get herself established in the community. And then uh, with that wherewithal, she would then uh, later in the late 1940s form her own company right at the time when film noir was becoming popular. And her name should be mentioned along with some of the greats in film noir, including John Huston, who did some great, great work. But I mean, she patterned her work as a director and producer uh, on what Alfred Hitchcock was doing because Alfred Hitchcock like liked to not be disturbed by the producers of his films because he wanted to direct exactly the way he wanted to do it. And so uh, she wanted to do the same thing. So she pioneered uh, women directors and she also was the first woman director of film noir. And mm -hmm. then she moved on to this uh, very new uh, uh, career, which was directing uh, television uh, shows and she she was very prolific in television and then of course uh she would appear later as she got older with her husband howard duff in films and and and, and, and television most notably uh, as a villain along with her husband uh, howard duff uh, on batman she got to play a villain yes. on batman. you know it's kind of, yes. kind of interesting that um, uh, a little known fact about her unless you're a avid crossword puzzler as i am uh is that uh, her name ida not Lupino, Ida is is very frequently found in both difficult and easy crossword puzzles because you know that IDA fits in so many places. I, you know that makes a lot of sense, Art. I agree. With that. I mean that's perfect, actually. Uh, you know she was also really good at mentoring talent. Now I don't know if you know this, but before he passed on, I was actually very close friends with Hugh O'Brien. Um, I, I knew him till the day he died, and I was lucky to spend the last, you know, five to ten years knowing him and was invited to Christmas parties, and things like that. He and his wife, Virginia, were considered among my friends. And he would often mention that Ida Lupino actually discovered him and not only discovered him, but when he would get roles, he would go over to her house and she would she would actually audition him to prepare him for roles. And this wow. is the kinds of things she did not only for Hugh, but for others. And she was really well known for this a very, very uh, pay it forward kind of actress and, and, produ and producer of film. Hmm. Wow. Great, great names, uh, Manny. Terrific. Really spanning the gap going back to the beginning of film to uh, to the mid century. And you know what I've done today is giving you a hint on my next book when it does finally come out, because the first chapter is going to tell the story of Ida Lupino Ooh. and other uh, famous filmmakers such as Lenny Riefenstahl and Dorothy Spencer. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, I like doing that. I like sharing what I'm writing about. And this was a, a great topic. And I just thought, gosh, you know, John, Art, I think they're going to love the stories. You know, you know, oh. you know Manny, uh, it's always uh, so sweet of you to take us down the through the gate that's ivy covered and uh, these little lanes in old Hollywood uh, and uh, peeking in a door here and there and say, you know, Ida Lupino is a director in there and, and Lucio Ball yep. and John Ford. And, and thank you. Thank you for a great stroll down memory lane. Well, thank you. Well, this is not so much Ivy cover, color, uh, covered today as it was Ida covered, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very great. Can't, look, uh, can't be soon enough till we get together again and talk about the next piece of forgotten lore that 
you have, you know, it's just that we've forgotten it. And thank you for bringing back Ida and uh, uh, some other interesting people for us. As always, thank you. Always a pleasure, you know that. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.